Chapter 5. Oliver mingles with new associates, and going to a funeral for the first time forms an unfavorable notion of his master's business. Oliver being left to himself in the undertaker's shop set the lamp down on a workman's bench and gazed timidly about him with a feeling of awe and dread, which many people a good deal older than Oliver will be at no loss to understand. An unfinished coffin on black trestles which stood in the middle of the shop looked so gloomy and deathlike that a cold tremble came over him every time his eyes wandered in the direction of the dismal object, from which he almost expected to see some frightful form slowly rear its head to drive him mad with terror. Against the wall were ranged in regular array a long row of elm boards, cut into the same shape and looking in the dim light like high-shouldered ghosts with their hands in their breeches pockets. Coffin plates, elm chips, bright-headed nails, and shreds of black cloth lay scattered on the floor, and the wall above the counter was ornamented with a lively representation of two mutes in very stiff neckcloths. On duty at a large private door with a hearse drawn by four black steeds approaching in the distance. The shop was close and hot, and the atmosphere seemed tainted with the smell of coffins. The recess beneath the counter in which his flock mattress was thrust looked like a grave. Nor were these the only dismal feelings which depressed Oliver. He was alone in a strange place, and we all know how chilled and desolate the best of us will sometimes feel in such a situation. The boy had no friends to care for or to care for him. The regret of no recent separation was fresh in his mind. The absence of no loved and well-remembered face sunk heavily into his heart. But his heart was heavy notwithstanding, and he wished, as he crept into his narrow bed, that that were his coffin, and that he could be laid in a calm and lasting sleep in the churchyard ground, with the tall grass waving gently above his head and the sound of the old deep bell to soothe him in his sleep. Oliver was wakened in the morning by a loud kicking at the outside of the shop door, which, before he could huddle on his clothes, was repeated in an angry and impetuous manner about twenty-five times, and when he began to undo the chain, the legs left off their volleys, and a voice began. "'Open the door, will yer? cried the voice which belonged to the legs which had kicked at the door. "'I will directly, sir,' replied Oliver, undoing the chain and turning the key. "'I suppose you're the new boy, ain't you?' said the voice through the keyhole. "'Yes, sir,' replied Oliver. "'How old are you?' inquired the voice. Eleven, sir, replied Oliver. Then I'll whop you when I get in, said the voice. You just see if I don't. That's all, my workus brat. And having made this obliging promise, the voice began to whistle. Oliver had been too often subjected the, to the process to which the very expressive monosyllable just recorded bears reference to entertain the smallest doubt that the owner of the voice, whoever he might be, would redeem his pledge most honorably. He drew back the bolts with a trembling hand and opened the door. For a second or two, Oliver glanced up the street and down the street and over the way, impressed with the belief that the unknown who had addressed him through the keyhole had walked a few paces off to warm himself, for no... For nobody did Oliver see, but a big charity boy, sitting on the post in front of the house, eating a slice of bread and butter, which he cut into wedges the size of his mouth with a clasp knife, and then consumed with great dexterity. "'I beg your pardon, sir,' said Oliver at length, seeing that no other visitor made his appearance. "'Did you knock?' "'I kicked,' replied the charity boy. "'Did you want a coffin, sir?' inquired Oliver, innocently." At this, the charity boy looked monstrous fierce and said that Oliver would stand in need of one before long if he cut jokes with his superiors in that way. "'You don't know who I am, I suppose, Workus,' said the, chari said the charity boy in continuation, descending from the top of the post, meanwhile, with edifying gravity. "'No, sir,' rejoined, Ol rejoined Oliver. "'I am Mr. Noah Claypole,' said the charity boy, "'and you're under me. Take down the shutters, you idle young ruffian.' With this, Mr. Claypole administered a kick to Oliver and entered the shop with a dignified air, which did him great credit. It is difficult for a large-headed, small-eyed youth of lumbering make and heavy countenance to look di dignified under any circumstances. But it is more especially so when, superadded to these personal attractions, are a red nose and yellow smalls. Oliver, having taken down the shutters and broken a pane of glass in his efforts to stagger away beneath the weight of the first one to a small court at the side of the house in which they were kept during the day, was graciously assisted by Noah, who, having consoled him with the assurance that he'd catch it, con condescended to help him. Mr. Sowerberry came down soon after, and shortly afterwards Mrs. Sowerberry appeared, and Oliver, having caught it in fulfillment of Noah's prediction, followed that young gentleman downstairs to breakfast. "'Come near the fire, Noah,' said Charlotte. "'I saved a nice little piece of bacon for you for Master's breakfast. "'Oliver, shut that door at Mr. Noah's back "'and take them bits that I've put out on the cover of the bread pan. "'There's your tea. "'Take it away to that box and drink it there and make haste, "'for they'll want you to mind the shop. "'Do you hear?' "'Do you hear, Workus?' 
said Noah Claypole. Goodness, Noah, said Charlotte, what a rum creature you are. Why don't you let the boy alone? Let him alone, said Noah. Why, everybody lets him alone enough for the matter of that. Neither his father nor mother will ever interfere with him. All his relations let him ha have his own way pretty well. Eh, Charlotte? Heh <laughs> Oh, you queer soul, said Charlotte, bursting into a hearty laugh, in which she was joined by Noah, after which they both looked scornfully at poor Oliver Twist, He sat as he sat shivering upon the box in the coldest corner of the room, and ate the stale pieces which had been specially reserved for him. Noah was a charity boy, but not a workhouse orphan. No chance child was he, for he could trace his genealogy back all the way to his parents, who lived hard by, his mother being a washerwoman and his father a drunken soldier, discharged with a wooden leg and a diurnal pension of two pence half penny and an unstatable fraction. The shop boys in the neighborhood had long been in the habit of branding Noah in the public streets with the ignominious epithets of leathers, charity, and the like, and Noah had borne them without reply. But now that fortune had cast in his way a nameless orphan at whom even the meanest could point the finger of scorn, he retorted on him with interest. This affords charming food for contemplation. It shows us what a beautiful thing human nature is, and how impartially the same amiable qualities are developed in the finest lord and the dirtiest charity boy. Oliver had been sojourning at the undertaker's some three weeks or a month, and Mr. and Mrs. Sowerberry, the shop being shut up, were taking their supper in the little back parlor, when Mr. Sowerberry, after several deferential glances at his wife, said, My dear, he was going to say more, but Mrs. Sowerberry, looking up with a pecu peculiarly unpretious, <clears throat> unpretious aspect, he stopped short. Well, said Mrs. Sowerberry sharply. Nothing, my dear, nothing, said Mr. Sowerberry. Ah, uh, you brute! said Mrs. Sowerberry. Not at all, my dear, said Mr. Sowerberry humbly. I thought you didn't want to hear, my dear. I was only going to say... Oh, don't tell me what you were going to say, interposed Mrs. Sowerberry. I am nobody. Don't consult me, pray. I don't want to intrude upon your secrets. And as Mrs. Sowerberry said this, she gave an hysterical laugh, which threatened violent consequences. But my dear, said Sowerberry, I want to ask your advice. No, no, don't ask mine, replied Mrs. Sowerberry, in an affecting manner. Ask somebody else's. Here there was another hysterical laugh, which frightened Mr. Sowerberry very much. This is a very common and much approved matrimonial course of treatment, which is often very effective. It at once reduced Mr. Sowerberry to begging, as a special favor to be allowed to say what Mrs. Sowerberry was most curious to hear, and after a short altercation of less than three quarters of an hour's duration, the permission was most graciously conceded. It's only about young Twist, my dear, said Mr. Sowerberry. A very good-looking boy, that, my dear. He needs be, for he eats enough, observed the lady. There's an expression of melancholy in his face, my dear, resumed Mr. Sowerberry, which is very interesting. He would make a delightful mute, my dear. Mrs. Sowerberry looked up with an expression of considerable wonderment. Mr. Sowerberry remarked it, and without allowing time for any observation on the good lady's part, proceeded. I don't mean a regular mute to attend grown-up people, my dear, but only for ch children's practice. It would be very new to have a mute in proportion, my dear. You may depend upon it that it would have a superb effect. Mrs. Sowerberry, who had a great, a good deal of taste in the undertaking way, was much struck by the novelty of the idea, but as it would have been com compromising her dignity to have said so under existing circumstances, she merely inquired with much sharpness why such an obvious suggestion had not presented itself to her husband's mind before. Mr. Sowerberry rightly construed this as acquiescence in his proposition. It was speedily determined that Oliver should be at once initiated into the mysteries of the profession, and with this view, that he should accompany his master on the very next occasion of his services being acquired. The occasion was not long in coming, for half an hour after breakfast next morning, Mr. Bumble entered the shop, and supporting his cane against the counter, drew forth his large leathern pocket book, from which he selected a small scrap of paper which he handed over to Sowerberry. Aha, said the undertaker, glancing over it with a lively countenance. An order for a coffin, eh? For a coffin first, and a parochial funeral afterwards, replied Mr. Bumble, fastening the strap of the leathern pocket book, which, which, like himself, was very corpulent. Baton, said the undertaker, looking from the scrap of paper to Mr. Bumble. I never heard the name before. Bumble shook his head as he replied. Obstinate people, Mr. Sowerberry, very obstinate. Proud, too, I'm afraid, sir. Proud, eh? exclaimed Mr. Sour Mr. Sowerberry with a sneer. Come, that's too much. Oh, it's sickening, replied the beetle. Perfectly antimonial, Mr. Sowerberry. So it is, acquiesced the undertaker. We only heard of them the night before last, said the beetle, and we shouldn't have known anything about them then. Only a woman who lodges in the same house made an application to the parochial committee for them, to send the parochial surgeon to see a woman as was very bad. He had gone out to dinner, but his apprentice, which is a very clever lad, sent him some medicine in a blacking bottle offhand. 
Ah, uh, there's promptness, said the undertaker. Promptness indeed, replied the beetle. But what's the consequence? What's the ungrateful behavior of those rebels, huh? Er, sir? Why, the husband sends back word that the medicine won't suit his wife's complaint, and so she shan't take it. Says she shan't take it, sir. Good strong wholesome medicine as was given with great success to two Irish laborers and a coal heaver only a week before, sent him for nothing with a blacking bottle in, and he sends back word that she shan't take it, sir. As the flagrant atrocity presented itself to Mr. Bumble's mind in full force, he struck the counter sharply with his cane and became flushed with indignation. Well, said the undertaker, I never did. Never did, sir, ejaculated the beetle. No, nor ever, nobody ever did. But now she's dead. We've got a barrier, and that's the direction, and the sooner it's done, the better. Thus saying, Mr. Bumble put on his cocked hat wrong, cocked hat wrong side first, in a fever of parochial excitement, and flounced out of the shop. Why, he was so angry, Oliver, that he forgot even to ask after you, said Mr. Sourberry, looking after the beetle as he strode down the street. Yes, sir, replied Oliver, who had carefully kept himself out of sight during the interview, and who was shaking from head to foot at the mere recollection of the sound of Mr. Bumble's voice. He needn't have taken the trouble to shrink from Mr. Bumble's glance, however, for that functionary on whom the prediction of the gentleman in the white waistcoat had made a very strong impression thought that now that thought that now the undertaker had got Oliver upon trial, the subject was better avoided until such time as he should be firmly bound for seven years, and all danger of his being returned upon the hands of the parish should thus be effectually and legally overcome. Well, said Mr. Sourberry, taking up his hat, the sooner this job is done, the better. Noah, look after the shop. Oliver, put on your cap and come with me. Oliver obeyed and followed his master on his professional mission. They walked on for some time through the most crowded and densely inhabited part of the town, and then striking down a narrow street more dirty and miserable than any they had yet passed through, paused to look for the house which was the object of their search. The houses on either side were high and large, but very old, and tenanted by people of the poorest class, as their neglected appearance would have sufficiently denoted, without the concurrent testimony afforded by the squalid looks of the few men and women who, with folded arms and bodies half-doubled, occasionally skulked like shadows along. A great many of the tenements and hatch... Tenements had shop fronts, but they were fast closed and mouldering away, only the upper rooms being inhabited. Others, which had become insecure from age and decay, were prevented from falling into the street by huge beams of wood, which were reared against the tottering walls and firmly planted in the road, but even these crazy dens seemed to have been selected as the nightly haunts of some houseless wretches, for many of the rough boards which supplied the place of door and window were wrenched from their positions to afford an aperture wide enough for the passage of a human body. The kennel was stagnant and filthy. The very rats that here and there lay putrefying in its rottenness were hideous with famine. There was neither knocker nor bell handle at the open door where Oliver and his master stopped. So, groping his way cautiously through the dark passage, and bidding Oliver keep close to him and not be afraid, the undertaker mounted to the top of the first flight of stairs, and stumbling against a door on the landing, rapped at it with his knuckles. It was opened by a young girl of thirteen or fourteen. The undertaker at once saw enough of what the room contained to know it was the apartment to which he had been directed. He stepped in, and Oliver followed him. There was no fire in the room. <clears throat> but a man was crouching mechanically over, over the empty stove. An old woman, too, had drawn a low stool to the cold hearth and was sitting beside him. There were some ragged children in another corner, and in a small recess opposite the door, there lay upon the ground something covered with an old blanket. Oliver shuddered as he cast his eyes towards the place, and crept involuntarily closer to his master, for though it was covered up, the boy felt that it was a corpse. The man's face was thin and very pale, his hair and beard were grisly, and his eyes were bloodshot. The old woman's face were, was wrinkled. Her two remaining teeth protruded over, un, over her under lip, and her eyes were bright and piercing. Oliver was afraid to look at either her or the man. They seemed so like the rats he had seen outside. "'Nobody should go near her,' said the man, starting fiercely up as the undertaker approached the recess. "'Keep back, dang you. Keep back if you've a life to lose.' "'Nonsense, my good man,' said the undertaker, who was pretty well used to misery in all its shapes. "'Nonsense!' "'I tell you,' said the man, clenching his hands and stamping furiously on the floor. "'I tell you, I won't have her put, in the, put into the ground. "'She couldn't rest there. The worms would worry, not eat her. "'She is so worn away.' "'The undertaker offered no reply to this raving, "'but producing a tape from his pocket, "'knelt down for a moment by the side of the body. "'Ah,' said the man, bursting into tears "'and sinking on his knees at the feet of the dead woman. "'Kneel down, kneel down, kneel round here, ev kneel round her, every one of you, "'and mark my words.' I say she starved to death. I never knew how bad she was till the fever came upon her, and then her bones were starting through the skin. There was neither fire nor candle. She died in the dark. In the dark. 
She couldn't even see her children's faces, though we heard her gasping out their names. I begged for her in the streets, and they sent me to prison. When I came back, she was dying, and all the blood in my heart had dried up, and for they starved her to death. I swear it before the God that saw it. They starved her. He twined his hands in his hair, and with a loud scream rolled groveling upon the floor, his eyes fixed in the foam gushing from his lips. The terrified children cried bitterly, but the old woman, who had hitherto remained as quiet as if she had been wholly deaf to all that passed, menaced them into silence, and having unloosened the man's cravat, who still remained extended on the ground, tottered towards the undertaker. "'She was my daughter,' said the old woman, nodding her head in the direction of the corpse, and speaking with an idiotic leer, more ghastly than even the presence of death itself. "'Well, it is strange that I who gave birth to her and was a woman then should be alive and merry now, and she lying there so cold and stiff. To think of it, it's as good as a play, as good as a play.' As the wretched creature mumbled and chuckled in her hideous merriment, the undertaker, the undertaker turned to go away. "'Stop, stop,' said the old woman in a loud whisper. "'Will she be buried tomorrow, or next day, or tonight? "'I laid her out, and I must walk, you know. "'She sent, send me a large cloak, a good warm one, for it is bitter cold. "'We should have cake and wine, too, before we go. "'Never mind, send some bread, only a loaf of bread and a cup of water. "'Shall we have some bread, dear?' she said eagerly, "'catching at the undertaker's coat as he once more moved towards the door. "'Yes, yes,' said the undertaker, "'of course, anything, everything.' He disengaged himself from the old woman's grasp, and dragging Oliver after him, hurried away. The next day, the family having been meanwhile relieved with a half quartern loaf and a piece of cheese, left with them by Mr. Bumble himself, Oliver and his master returned to the miserable abode where Mr. Bumble had already arrived, accompanied by four men from the workhouse who were to act as bearers. An old black cloak had been thrown over the rags of the old woman and the man. The bear coffin, having been screwed down, was then hoisted on the shoulders of the bearers and carried downstairs into the street. "'Now you must put your best leg foremost, old lady,' whispered Sowerberry in the old woman's ear. "'We're rather late, and it won't do to keep the clergyman waiting. Move on, my men, as quick as you like.' Thus directed, the bearers trotted on, under their light burden, and the two mourners kept as near them as they could. Mr. Bumble and Sowerberry walked at a good smart pace in front, and Oliver, whose legs were not as long as his master's, ran by the side. There was not so great a necessity for hurrying as Mr. Sowerberry had anticipated, however, for when they reached the obscure corner in the, of the churchyard in which the nettles grew and the parish graves were made, the clergyman had not arrived, and the clerk, who was sitting by the vestry room fire, seemed to think it by no means improbable that it might be an hour or so before he came. So they set the buyer down on the brink of the grave, and the two mourners waited patiently in the damp clay with the cold rain drizzling down, while the ragged boys, whom the spectacle had attracted into the churchyard, played a noisy game at hide-and-seek among the tombstones, or varied their amusements by jumping backwards and forwards over the coffin. Mr. Sowerberry and Bumble, being personal friends of the clerk, sat by the fire with them and read the paper. At length, after the lapse of something more than an hour, Mr. Bumble and Sowerberry and the clerk were seen running towards the grave, and immediately afterwards the clergyman appeared, putting on his surplice as he came along. Mr. Bumble then threshed a boy or two to keep up appearances, and the reverend gentleman, having read as much of the burial service as could be compressed into four minutes, gave his surplice to the clerk and ran away again. "'Now, Bill,' said Sowerberry to the grave digger, "'fill it up. It was no very difficult task, for the grave was so full that the uppermost coffin was within a few feet of the surface. The grave digger, shoveled in the earth, stamped it loosely down with his feet, shouldered his spade, and walked off, followed by the boys, who murmured very loud complaints at the fun being over so soon. "'Come, my good fellow,' said Bumble, tapping the man on the back. "'They want to shut up the yard.' The man, who had never once moved since he had taken his station by the graveside, started, raised his head, stared at the person who had addressed him, walked forward for a few paces, and then fell down in a fit. The crazy old woman, who was too much occupied in bewailing the loss of her cloak, which the undertaker had taken off, to pay him any attention, so they threw a can of cold water over him, and when he came to, saw him safely out of the churchyard, locked the gate, and departed on their different ways. "'Well, Oliver,' said Sowerberry as they walked home, "'how do you like it?' "'Pretty well, thank you, sir,' replied Oliver, with considerable hesitation. "'Not very much, sir.' "'Ah, uh, you'll get used to it in time, in time Oliver,' said a Sowerberry. "'Nothing when you are used to it, my boy.' Oliver wondered in his own mind whether it had taken a very long time to get Mr. Sowerberry used to it, but he thought it better not to ask the question, and walked back to the shop, thinking over all he had seen and heard.'